medical errors are uh, a huge problem uh, in America and in, in worldwide. Uh, it's a little different from medical malpractice. Medical malpractice is a, a, a mistake that a doctor makes uh, or could be a nurse um, from his or her practice that is below the standard of care. Medical errors are things that happen normally, uh, but they are mistakes, and they're not necessarily below the standard of care, but they uh, kill and wound uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans. Uh, there were some major cases in the uh, late 20th century where pe famous people died of medical errors, like the Shah of Iran died when in uh, spleen surgery when his pancreas was nicked. He actually died of the complications of that. John Wayne died uh, when he had a colonoscopy at Harvard and they missed cancerous polyps. Andy Warhol, probably the last artist with uh, mass appeal, uh, died uh, in New York Hospital, a very uh, famous institution. Uh, after routine gallbladder surgery, probably because he was overly irrigated, hydrated by tubes. Um, uh, others uh, didn't die, but their cases were famous. Uh, the actor uh, uh, Dennis Quaid, uh, he had some, uh, he had a, a couple of infant, uh, he and his wife had a couple of uh, infant twins. Uh, they uh, had an, inf uh, an infection, they were given an anticoagulant drug, unfortunately they were given it in adult strength, and they almost uh, bled to death. Uh, I could go on and on, but there were many of these very famous cases, and they really crystallized uh, attention uh, of the media and of the medical profession. Uh, in the late 90s, uh, a unit of the National Academy of Sciences called the Institute of Medicine did a report, it was based on three states, a very careful uh, report uh, 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 that was based on chart analysis of, of, of tens of thousands of patients in Colorado, Utah, and New York, and they came up with a number, or two numbers, a range basically, which is how medicine sometimes does it, 44,000 to 98,000 deaths, deaths annually. Uh, that's the equivalent of a jumbo jet going down every day. Uh, it attracted some attention, uh, and uh, uh, there have been some reforms since then. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a massive problem. Uh, with electronic charts, we found out that it's much bigger uh, it's probably, I guess the best study uh, shows that it's between 210 and 440,000 deaths a year, probably towards the high side. Uh, and uh, that's the third largest cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer, both of which are about a half a million deaths a year. So it's a real problem. and. Uh, uh, just about everybody knows uh, someone who went into a hospital or a nursing home came out with a bad infection or perhaps had a drug interaction uh, or overdose uh, or uh, uh, maybe uh, certainly in a nursing home fell. Uh, a fall while you're in treatment is an error. It shouldn't happen. Uh, and uh, we're trying to deal with these things institutionally, but uh, 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 there's also a lot of uh, institutional pr professional resistance to tried and true uh, methods, and that's one of the, that's a big part of the, of the book I wrote, which is what are the real errors and how do we address them? 100,000 people in this country uh, uh, die each year uh, from 
healthcare acquired infections or hospital acquired infections, they're called HAIs. And there's just a lot of things that, that can be done to, uh, uh, to address that. Um, that also started with a very famous case uh, at Johns Hopkins, then probably is now uh, the best or close to the best hospital system in the country. Uh, uh, a toddler went in there with uh, bad burns. She was treated for her burns, and, uh, but she both got an infection. Uh, probably because of poor antibiotic control, and that her IV lines, uh, or her main IV line, was in the groin, the so-called femoral site high on the, uh, on the thigh, which is very prone to infection. Um, she shouldn't have died. She was scheduled to come out of the hospital. Uh, the problem that brought her into the hospital, she's very famous little girl, her name is Josie King. Um, uh, she, but she got this infection and she was dehydrated and it killed her. Uh, the hospital system uh, assigned a very uh, a brilliant young physician named Peter Pronovost to investigate and he became, uh, he investigated it, he was completely honest, and he uh, uh, blamed the hospital for what, what happened. But he also became uh, one of the leaders of the American um, anti-error movement, and came up with uh, uh, these so-called uh, bundles of procedures that, um, if applied, reduce serious infections almost down to zero. Now, the one he's most famous for is for uh, central line associated bloodstream infections. In the, in the trade, they're known as CLABSIs, C-L-A-B-S-I. Uh, and uh, basically, it, it, you, you need to have uh, you don't you don't put the central line in the femoral site. Uh, you obviously have uh, 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 rigorous hand washing and and draping uh, uh, controls. You take out the line uh, when it needs to be taken out. You don't just let it sit there because the longer it stays in, uh, the more prone people are to infection. But his, his bundle has been applied all over the country. And it used to be considered that the sickest patients who would have these central lines in, maybe 10% of them would die. Would, uh, uh, but now that goes down when these uh, controls are rigorously applied, they go down to zero. Another uh, big error is uh, medication errors. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, they give the wrong drug um, or they mix drugs uh, uh, that they shouldn't. Uh, there's another extremely famous case in New York City, um, an a healthy 18-year-old uh, young woman named Libby Zion goes into uh, a, a hospital. She presents with some shaking and a high fever. Uh, and uh, um, they don't have any, uh, they just have doctors in training on site to deal with all the patients in the hospital. They have a resident and an intern. And they don't know what to do with her. And uh, um, they've been up for days. Okay, so what do they do? They restrain her and they give her uh, um, an anti-spasmodic drug and, uh, an anti and, and a, a, a synthetic op opiate. I think it was, it was an opioid, I think it was synthetic. In any event, that has a lethal drug interaction 
associated with it, so an 18-year-old uh, dies in the morning. Well, that led to a lot of reforms, particularly for residents all over the country. Now uh, they can only work 24 hours straight and only 80 hours in a week. Now that's a big reform compared to the way they used to, to work. So, so things like, like that have happened due to the attention that has been uh, uh, focused on these issues. Now, uh, it's, it, we're far from out of the woods. We still have a quarter of a million deaths per year from uh, these issues. Sometimes, for example, you'll have a wrong site surgery. And there's a very famous one of those that was in Tampa, for example, construction worker named Willie King, um, had the wrong leg cut off in the uh, late 80s, I believe. Uh, and, uh, but that led to new rigorous double checking type procedures uh, in the operating room where um, everybody goes over, first of all, what is the procedure we're doing? Who is the patient? What is the site of the operation? And not only that, but anybody now um, in a good hospital can stop the surgery. A nurse can speak up and say, hey, wait a minute. We, looks like we're gonna close and leave an instrument in, in, the, in the site. Or we're gonna, we're gonna operate on the uh, left leg instead of the right leg. It's very important. It seems so basic in a way, uh, but uh, it's critical. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, we're in a um, in hospitals and 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 uh, uh, mainly in hospitals, but also in 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 long term long term care facilities. We're we're not in a regulatory environment. We're in a uh, accreditory environment. And that means that the accrediting agency comes around about once every three years and takes a look. Very seldom will shut down a hospital. Now, in Willie King's case, they actually uh, did shut down a major hospital in Tampa for a while after they operated on, on the, uh, the wrong leg. Um, and, but uh, we have all these marvelous uh, CDC, Centers, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, guidelines about infection, for example. Every tool, every, every surgical tool, every autoclave, that's, an, that's a, a disinfecting chamber, uh, every uh, uh, water source in a hospital, every air source in a hospital, uh, every uh, uh, room, hospital room, is based on, uh, has, has an entire uh, regimen of what disinfects or sterilizes, in other words, what the compound is, how long it has to be in contact with the tool. Uh, we know these things from 75 years of experimentation and study and evidence but they're only applied after an outbreak. It's not a regulatory system. And I don't know if this is, is really making sense, but people think their hospitals are regulated. They're actually not, only after an outbreak. And I think that uh, they should be better regulated. And or when people go into a hospital or a nursing home, they or their advocates or guardians, when they sign their financial responsibility form, the hospital should promise that it's going to abide by all CDC guidelines. It should be part of the contract. Um, I think that would cut down on a lot of uh, uh, really, really anti, uh, really unnecessary uh, uh, infection that we have today in hospitals. 
Yeah, MRSA is, uh, is an epidemic in America. Uh, it's, uh, MRSA is uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's, it's a staph infection that's, that's resistant to um, uh, normal antibiotic control. Uh, and for some, re for some reason, and I, I don't know the reason, I've tried to figure it out, America is different from other countries with, or some other countries, such as the United Kingdom, uh, in terms of, of MRSA control. The, the big difference is, okay, how do, how do in, infections get into hospitals? Well, very often patients bring them in. But with uh, uh, MRSA, it's, it's standard procedure in the United Kingdom that when a patient comes in, gets a brief nasal swab, that's cultured to see if the patient has MRSA. The patient, has, uh, the patient may not be infected, he may just have colonized MRSA germs. But there are treatments for that. Maybe you can, or maybe the, the, the staff can treat the MRSA. If not, the patient can be isolated. And then there are uh, important infection, con infectious uh, barriers, controls that can be implemented. Uh, patients, MRSA patients stay with other MRSA patients or are completely isolated. They, uh, uh, doctors and nurses who deal with them use, stay, use disposable paper gowns and masks. They use them one time. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in other countries, again, United Kingdom, Holland, I believe Denmark, where they do this, MRSA is a very small percentage of staph infections. Uh, in this country, it's, it's over 50%. So I don't know why we don't do that, but we don't. We should. You have a right when you go into a hospital to see the history of the room and the room cleaning, okay? I would advise people, if they possibly can, not to go into a room, wait for another room, but not to go into a room where the last occupant had MRSA or uh, Clostridium difficile, sometimes called C. diff, or VRE, uh, I think that's vancomycin resistant enterococcus, which is a gut infection. Uh, you don't want to, it raises your chances enormously of getting that, uh, 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 that illness. You also want to see that the room record will show you whether all high touch surfaces such as the light switches, the toilet handle, uh, 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 the areas around the bed, uh, have, been, uh, have been properly cleaned. Now proper cleaning is a big issue in hospitals because it costs money. It should be inspected with something with, with maybe uh, an, some type of illuminometer which lights up bacteria, microbes. Uh, in addition, uh, there are methods out there, but they are expensive. Uh, and some hospitals sort of go halfway with it. They may have one or two um, ultraviolet way, uh, ray zapping machines that go into a room, zap all the surfaces, kill the MRSA, kill everything, okay? Uh, or you mentioned hydrogen peroxide. There are hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, foggers do the same thing. Take some time, they, they are relatively expensive. Um, a UV zapper, I think the last time I looked, uh, cost about $70,000. Um, now that's more expensive than the uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide fogger but the hydrogen peroxide fogger takes more, money, more time. So it's time is money, and that's especially true in healthcare. Um, but, I mean, we have these methodologies. They're called no-touch disinfection. 
you should have them for, for rooms, especially rooms uh, where uh, people have had infections. I would say you should have them for rooms where uh, people are most vulnerable, like ICUs, uh, intensive care units. Um, but, uh, uh, I mean, hospitals, unfortunately, are, uh, they're more inclined today uh, to spend money on um, uh, fancy therapeutic technologies, robotics, hospitality elements, things of that nature, which sell the hospital. Cleaning doesn't sell the hospital. Uh, another thing that should happen is that um, uh, hospitals should compete and be graded on their infection rates. They are not. You won't find out. It's very difficult to find out. Now, if you go to a surgeon for if you're going to go in and have a procedure, he or she should tell you his rate of infection. And I would certainly urge everyone to find that out. One of the things that we, we've also learned since this flurry of news and media attention in the, in the late uh, 90s, um, or in the late 20th century, the 80s and 90s, is that experience matters. It matters critically. And uh, uh, if you're, if you're going to have, whether it's a, a knee surgery or a hip surgery, uh, uh, heart bypass, um, whatever you're going to have done in the hospital, if you, if you have the chance to plan, you should find out the experience level of whomever is performing it. And there are excellent studies that show that the more experience the surgeon has, the better your likely outcome is. And that can be for very sophisticated surgery, pancreatic surgery, or it can be for a common uh, 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 knee surgery. But it's very, very important to, to, to understand the experience of that surgeon. Um, I, I just can't underscore that enough. Well, that's a real issue and it's a real problem. I mean, uh, uh, about, I think it's about a quarter of the time in some hospital systems that the, uh, there's a language barrier, for example. That's a, that's a problem. A lot of times uh, you're dealing with, with patients who, um, may not be, uh, or they may be demented, or they might be post-trauma or something like that. So it is, it's a very difficult situation. Yes, people should, uh, to the extent possible, um, be knowledgeable. In the internet era, about two-thirds of people actually will do research, they found, on what doctors tell them about their diagnosis and the drugs that they're supposed to take. And that's a good thing, that's a good thing. Now, it, you can sometimes, you know, uh, not do a good job and have some faulty ideas, but it is a good, it's generally a very good thing. It's also a good thing um, to go into a hospital with a family member, with an advocate, if you possibly can. Um, and, uh, but, that's not available to a lot of people, unfortunately. Everybody talks about uh, uh, minimally invasive surgery. It could be for back. Uh, I mean, we see a lot of advertisements for that. It could be laparoscopic for gallbladder or uh, what have you. Generally, it's better. If, generally, it's better if, 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 if you, to have the, I'd say, the least surgery possible, and then when you have surgery, um, you have the least invasive surgery. Average American has nine surgeries in a lifetime. That's a lot. We're just starting to get our arms around, uh, which may be actually the largest source of error, is diagnostic error. 
it, it's not just in hospitals. I mean, it's, most of it is in doctor's offices. And, it, and based on uh, studies that have been done, mostly post-mortems, uh, we find that 20 to 40 percent of uh, people who have these post-mortems or autopsies had diagnostic errors. Um, diagnosis is really, really hard. Uh, and uh, it's, it's actually getting harder as the diagnostic tools get better. Um, there are a lot of uh, new imaging technologies. There are uh, very sophisticated uh, 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 pathology uh, uh, probes down to the molecular and genetic levels. The average, uh, it's a bad term, average physician, but the, the, the usual clinician can't keep pace with that and uh, often will order tests or not relatively blindly. So another th uh, theme uh, of of medicine that wants to uh, prevent errors is teamwork. Doctors, uh, they've gone to school 12 years maybe uh, uh, after high school, but they are not universal geniuses. They don't know every drug, every drug interaction, every procedure, every diagnosis. It's very, very important whether they're in surgery or they're diagnosing or they're prescribing, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It's very important that they do it as part of a system and in a team uh, with, with uh, team members who have the updated knowledge <clears throat> access to technologies that they, that they don't have. So one of the big problems is uh, we have a, a, a fee-for-service medical system. One of the three most hated letters in modern medicine are FFS, fee-for-service. And the reason why that's so difficult is that for Medicare, uh, and uh, private insurance, there are no codes for initial consultations with specialists before you actually hire the specialist. Now this is being looked at very seriously by Medicare and, and the federal government at least, so that when you go to a doctor and the doctor says, well, it looks like we need tests or I really can't say myself, before he engages the tests, uh, the contacts pathology or ra radiology, what have you, he actually can just talk to these people, have a conversation. Maybe you can be a part of it and everybody gets paid. Uh, because if people don't get paid, they don't work. And so uh, uh, there's, there's an, the, the three other most hated letters in modern medicine are CPT, Current Procedural Terminologies. And if you don't have a CPT code, you can't get paid. So we need CPT codes that, that really deal with initial just communications, brainstorming, how to do this. Uh, and we, when we don't do it, uh, uh, we get by bad diagnosis or, or non-diagnosis, uh, and uh, uh, the person who maybe has a bad illness doesn't get treated until too late. It's a big problem. So it, we're, there, there are probably up to, uh, and I don't want to seem alarmist here, this is really based on uh, uh, doctor at, at, uh, at Hopkins, who studies this and has written about it in the, in the British Medi Medical Journal. His name is David Newman Toker. He's a, uh, a very uh, uh, smart 
neurologist actually whose main area of study is stroke, but he studies uh, diagnostic error. There may be a half million deaths in this country from up to a half million deaths in this country uh, uh, from diagnostic error alone, which if that's true, it would make medical error the largest cause of death in this country. And it's very difficult to study. Most of it happens in doctor's offices, not in hospitals, which are even less uh, uh, overseen, uh, less regulated than hospitals. Uh, and uh, uh, how to get our arms around that problem is now a, a big source of study in uh, uh, the upper reaches of the medical profession, such as this Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences is now really studying, starting to put out reports about diagnostic error. We know from uh, uh, autopsy studies and from something called the National Practitioners Database, which is a uh, uh, a source of information that's uh, been uh, managed for more than a quarter century by the Department of Health and Human Services uh, that tracks uh, uh, malpractice settlements and uh, uh, verdicts that uh, diagnostic error is the biggest source of errors. It's not wrong site surgery, infection, medication error, or, or uh, uh, falls. Uh, or blood clots in the hospital. Uh, this is it. Uh, this is the biggest source. We, we really don't know yet all the ways to uh, uh, address it, uh, except it does seem that uh, uh, teamwork methods uh, should be applied at that early stage the way they are at later stages, such as surgery. Another thing, the, the actual uh, prescri prescribing of drugs is a, is a dangerous stage in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in healthcare. Um, and when it's studied, I mean, there, there's the ordering stage, there's the transcribing stage, there's the prescription filling stage by pharmacists, there's the administration stage. If you're in the hospital, that's usually by nurses. If you're at home, you do it or somebody does it with you. Um, what's the biggest source of the error? Actually, it's in the ordering stage. The doctors. Uh, from the, uh, from the get-go, they will prescribe uh, the wrong drug, maybe because it's not indicated or because maybe just because it's been prescribed in the past or because it's interactive with some drug that some other uh, drug that you're taking now uh, or maybe the patient has a new condition such as diabetes or something like that so he shouldn't he or she shouldn't take the drug what have you but more than 50 percent of the errors are in the ordering stage okay so we've developed um, something, uh, most good hospitals have something called CPOE, uh, Computerized Physician Order Entry. Okay, that's really good. It does show you, uh, 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 it'll point out an overdose, uh, it'll point out a drug interaction, it'll do some very good things. It's not enough. The best thing that a hospital can have in this area, and patients should ask for it, though it's expensive, is something called clinical pharmacy or decentralized pharmacy. That means a specialized pharmacist actually rounds with the doctors and nurses at bedside and keeps and, and, and is there for the initial drug ordering. 
Pharmacists know, there's, there are 10,000 prescription drugs that are active in the United States at this time, more than that, but that, that more than 10,000. Physicians can't keep up with it. They can't keep up with, I mean, they're, they're exploding. They're coming out all the time. Uh, and, and we know, and they're being studied all the time, or they should be. Uh, and the physicians only have a glancing knowledge of them, honestly. The pharmacists know about them. And the pharmacist will look at a person, perhaps elderly, and say, well, that dosage might work for a middle-aged person or for a young adult. But that won't work for an older person or a child, a baby. We have to do something else, maybe cut it. That's a whole uh, very important area. Um, so when they study, the largest study was about uh, half a million people uh, uh, where they studied uh, uh, group, uh, groups that had clinical pharmacy and groups that, uh, a group that did not, medication errors went down 45% in the group that had clinical pharmacy. Uh, it went down 94% in terms of, of deaths and serious injuries. I mean, this, it was a big reform in the early 20th century to have nurses make rounds with the doctors because the nurses were on the floor with the patients. They actually knew the patients. They actually were treating the patients. Uh, they, they knew about whether the patient was sleeping, whether the patient was uh, the voiding, whatever. Very, very important. Now we need to have pharmacists included in these rounds. Very important because once you get the wrong drug on board, it's very difficult uh, uh, to, to stop it. And the drugs can be very destructive. The side effects can be enormous, as we all know from watching TV. So uh, I would say that, again, it's this, it's this teamwork where, yeah, doctors are, are generally smart, they're generally dedicated, but they should be, but they're not universal geniuses about all aspects of healthcare. They should be part of teams uh, and uh, uh, they should be um, subjected to uh, 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 information controls. Uh, in other words, information should flow uh, in a rational way. Um, there's a, a really important concept in medicine called the handoff. You're in a hospital. You're dealing, uh, or your, your parent is, or uh, your loved one is, and you're dealing with different shifts, particularly of residents. Okay, the day shift resident said, well, we're going to cut back on, the, uh, uh, on this heart medication now uh, because uh, the heart rate has gone down dangerously low. And that's a, that, that has various risk factors associated with it. Next resident comes on, he's still using the medication. And why is that? Well, that's because they haven't had an effective handoff. And it's a very dangerous time, this, this, this handoff period, this shift change period. And it's been studied quite a lot because it, there are a lot of errors that are made. And the most prestigious journal in the medical profession in this country is called the New England Journal of Medicine. It studied uh, in 2014 something called structured handoffs. Uh, in nine hospitals in New England and, and Canada uh, for, for kids, for pediatric patients, over 10,000 of them. And, and if you give residents uh, uh, a structured handoff protocol where they actually hit like a punch list about the patients, in terms of the patient's status, medical actions that are being taken, and most important, crisis planning. 
what is the thing that can go wrong and how do we have everybody on the team prepared for it? They found that medical errors went down 30%. Very, very important. And, and, and another place where it's very important is in the emergency department or emergency room. Um, a recent study showed that uh, an emergency department doctor in a 30-year career will send 44 patients home to die within seven days of going home. Those people should have been admitted and treated. Well, the big problem, there, there are a number of problems, but, but one of the problems is when you go in an emergency room, uh, uh, you're on somewhat of an assembly line. You go from uh, uh, maybe the, the nurse practitioner who takes your vitals to uh, uh, somebody else who may do some uh, uh, tests on you to somebody else to the doctor, maybe a specialist comes in. But in any event, if the information is lost or is mangled, in any way during those steps, you're at, greater, you're at greater risk. So we need these handoff controls at all stages, at all stages in the system. Now another thing that happens sometimes in the emergency department, and this, this is especially true with people who are showing stroke symptoms, is maybe we don't in time give the most expensive test. Maybe that test is an MRI, for example. And then the stroke victim is sent home. He or she is told, well, you're a little dizzy. Let's see if it passes. Maybe he has a worse stroke. Maybe he dies. Um, usually that doesn't happen. But for example, in what are called dizzy strokes, um, most, of the time it's, it, most of the time it's not a stroke. The person is just dizzy for a lot of different reasons that uh, we, can't, we, could, we don't need to go into them, but about 9% of the time they're misdiagnosed. The person gets sent home with a stroke. Very dangerous. And so it, it's, it's really important to have good diagnosis early, to have information flow rationally, to have good handoff controls, and uh, have uh, teamwork. I'm not a medical malpractice attorney. Uh, uh, I don't think that, I think the medical malpractice system uh, uh, in this country, uh, it does compensate a few people, uh, very, very small percentage of people uh, who are injured in hospitals. Uh, it certainly does not seem, in my view, to reduce medical errors generally. Um, and, uh, but uh, uh, doctors are very afraid of medical malpractice. And to the extent that they can, they, uh, many of them practice something called defensive medicine. It's a big problem, probably costs $50 billion a year. Just the massive ordering of tests, particularly. Uh, and uh, some of the tests, of course, can be uh, invasive or cause opportunities for infection or radiation exposure. Uh, uh, and I mean, there is a, uh, for, for some, in some situations, uh, more medicine uh, means more opportunity for errors and, and complications. Uh, it's, it's extremely expensive. Uh, it's not necessarily good medicine, the best practice, and uh, uh, it's a, uh, it is a byproduct of, of, uh, of tremendous fear of the medical malpractice system. And I think that uh, um, we should evolve to a system like they have in uh, some other countries, specialized health courts that uh, 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 deal with these problems faster, uh, more people get relief. Perhaps it's not as large as the big, big verdicts that hit for some people, but it would be a better system. Maybe, and you know, honestly, those systems uh, uh, only minimally use lawyers. I don't, I don't 
I don't know that the lawyers are really helping that much in the, uh, in malpractice. And, and now they do they do perform a valid service. Um, they do get some very badly injured people compensated, uh, and uh, uh, they have had a good effect on some areas of medicine. Um, uh, anesthesiology, for example, due to, in, to, to some degree to fear of malpractice, has become a, a much safer uh, field than it used to be. Well, I would say find out the experience of the person you're dealing with. Now, some doctors have uh, great bedside manner, great reputations. Uh, you can do a little research online, but it's not that good. Ask pointed questions. Find out how many times the doctor has done the procedure, what his or her success rate is, what his or her infection rate is. They should tell you that. Be a prudent medical consumer. Go shopping. Get the second opinion or the third opinion. Um, I, I, I would certainly say that. I would also say you really want to be sure you have adequate infection controls in, uh, 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 in a hospital, in, in uh, nursing care, uh, even in a clinical situation. This is going to sound trite. Don't let anybody touch you who hasn't freshly washed his or her hands. If the person has gloves on already, uh, say, are you coming from the last patient and, and have you washed your hands and changed your gloves? You should do that. It's a very, uh, every one of these uh, protocols, which are sometimes called bundles for infection control, whether it's for a central line or uh, of, uh, people on a ventilator uh, or a surgical site infection control. Every one of them um, includes hand hygiene. It's really difficult to get staff, doctors, nurses, to wash their hands properly. It, to wash your hands properly takes 15 seconds on all surfaces. Now they do it for a while, and, but, but but hand washing, and, and, and they have these uh, 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 spies who go around checking on them. They're, uh, they're not popular. They're sometimes called secret shoppers in hospitals. And, and for a while, they'll do it. But basically, hand washing control goes down to about, I'd say, 40% if, if uh, compliance. So what you want to do, uh, the best thing you can do First of all, be mindful of it. Don't let them get away with it. Don't let them even uh, uh, put a stethoscope on you if they haven't uh, uh, freshly uh, um, uh, uh, disinfected at least the bell of the stethoscope. Don't get in a wheelchair that hasn't been disinfected since the last patient. All of these things are your rights, but you have to, sp but you, but you have to speak up. Now for hand washing control, the thing, the thing that works the best is to put cameras, uh, uh, and there are cameras everywhere in our society now. But if you want doctors and nurses to wash their hands, put cameras by those alcohol dispensers, and they'll do it. Studies show that once you do that, compliance goes up over 90% and it stays there. So, but uh, yeah, you have to, you have to see good infection control or you're going to or 10 percent of people are going to come out of hospitals with infections and that's a mess if you have a bloodstream infection and you're septic you're really a sick person you don't want that you really don't want that and uh, uh, probably um, of the people who get infected maybe 10 percent of them will die from it so you, you, it's a it's a massive problem uh, we have, uh, you, you need a, uh, in the hospital, in the clinic, in the doctor's office, you need a, uh, a, a basic public health prevention orientation. And you want to see that if you can when you go into treatment.